So now we have Blake that's going to be speaking with Michael Guyot. All right. Well, I, I guess Enjoy. I'll take it from here. <laughs> is, it, is it time already? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. All right. Michael, um, pleasure to meet you. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me just introduce Michael Guyad. He's, uh, he is the, you know, you, I, I've recently just found out about you. And I want to say that um, I, I, I said this to Daniel DiMartino Booth yesterday. I wish I would have found you sooner. And the reason why I say that is um, as a trader of the markets and uh, you know, navigating through the markets uh, every day for the last 20 some odd years, I, I'm, I'm a trader of um, correlations. And, and uh, what I, correlations is one of the backbones of what I do. Uh, you know, I look at different asset classes and I'm using a macro backdrop or a mac macro theme and then, you know, combined with technical analysis and, you know, and I put it all together every day and, you know, try to make, you know, some money. And what I've learned about what you do is you, it seems like you combine a lot of different indicators to really come up with your conclusions on how you feel the market is going to perform moving forward. And that to me is extremely valuable from an investor standpoint. And so I'm really excited. And I told, I told our whole uh, audience yesterday, uh, uh, the question was, was posed to myself and, and the rest of us, you know, what are you guys, what are you guys excited about for the rest of the, the, uh, the event? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm excited to meet Michael. Um, if it seems like to me from what you do is very, very um, valuable to the, to, the, to the trading community at large. So Michael, uh, publisher of the lead lag report, it seems like you are an RAI uh, and, 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 and I'm really excited to, uh, to meet you. Now listen, I, uh, I appreciate that. I guess uh, no pressure given everything you just said. And by the way, I will say the last uh, panel discussion was phenomenal. I think the only thing I was missing was some popcorn. Uh, that was, uh, that was really quite entertaining. Um, so listen, I appreciate the, uh, the invite here. Thank you all for attending this. This is going to be more of a formal presentation, but I'm going to take some questions towards the end here. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. And, and Michael, while you're, while you're grabbing the screen and you know how to, you know how to take it all over, I, I want to say um, on behalf of the Traders Summit, uh, thank you so much for being a sponsor of the Traders Summit. And we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, but, uh, but we appreciate you having, uh, having you here and, and, and presenting. So uh, I'll let you go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and mute myself. All right. Very good. Uh, and everybody can see the screen okay, right? It looks, uh, looks fine. Okay. Um, looks good. For those who are not uh, familiar, my name is Michael Gayed. Um, we'll get into a little bit about my background, but this presentation is going to be very non-traditional in the sense that I'm going to be talking about two seemingly completely unrelated commodities and how they can help you determine risk on, risk off conditions in the stock market before it's too late. And I always love that, that line before it's too late, because I think unfortunately in this business, people are too busy reacting rather than anticipating. And the only way you can anticipate an accident is by identifying conditions that favor probabilities that favor the accident. I tell people all the time, you know, I run uh, a public mutual fund. I run uh, the lead lag report. I tell people all the time, you know, at, at the end of the day, I am not in the business of forecasting. I am a weatherman. And this presentation is going to be about using lumber and gold to help you determine if it's raining or not, again, before it's too late. Um, now, if you happen to be on Twitter, feel free to follow me. I know there's a big FinTwit crowd here. Uh, at lead lag report is my handle. Uh, please don't be a hater. I've got about 183,000 Twitter followers. Some of them are frankly just mean. And if you happen to be on LinkedIn, feel free to follow me there, connect me there. That way, if you're a hater, I at least know your name. All right, let me uh, give you a little bit of context about who I am, sort of a little bit about my credentials for those who are unfamiliar with me. Uh, I am a portfolio manager. I run the ATAC rotation fund, a mutual fund uh, under Toroso Investments. Uh, I'm a four-time uh, award-winning author, uh, two times with the Chartered Market Technicians Dow Award, two times with the National Association of Active Investment Managers Founders Award. 
Uh, and I'm the publisher of the Lee Lag Report, which is available at leelagreport.com. Uh, the papers are the underlying uh, mechanisms behind which the content is structured. If you want to check that out, by the way, since it's always good to be always be promoting, uh, check out leelagreport.com, put promo code Trader Summit, you'll get 30% off and two weeks free uh, of the Lead Lag Report itself. Uh, I used to have a phase in my life when I was on CNBC, Bloomberg, Marco Watch. I was really uh, all over the place uh, in the media doing the punditry nonsense. Um, please don't hold it against me, by the way. Uh, and for more information, feel free to reach out to me directly by email. Just don't spam me, Michael Guyad at leelagreport.com. Now, all of these papers that I've uh, presented across the country that I've won awards on. I've been to 47 states presenting at CFA chapters, CMT chapters, UBS offices, uh, you name it. All these papers have this common idea, common thread, that I may not know the exact mile marker. I might crash my car, but I do know the conditions that favor an accident. I know when it's raining to slow down, play risk off, when it's sunny to speed up, play risk on. And in the context of markets, there are leading indicators that help to identify conditions. In the last panel, everyone was, uh, I think, kind of thinking through longer term trends. I don't believe anybody can tell what the long term holds. I believe the best you can do is identify up to your horizon. And I have a lot of research that proves that quantitatively. Now, all these papers have this uh, thread of, again, identifying conditions that favor an accident in markets and use a school of thought or an approach to looking at markets called intermarket analysis. Now, what's intermarket analysis? I'm sure a lot of traders here are familiar with the term, but intermarket analysis, first of all, is a branch of technical analysis. Well, let's take a step back and let's define what technical analysis is. Technical analysis is about the study of price movements, where what you're looking at doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's a stock, bond, doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin, doesn't matter if it's a tulip. Uh, at the end of the day, technical, true technicians don't really care what they're looking at. They're looking at uh, past price behavior to extrapolate to the future, looking at various indicators to figure out what to position into. Intermarket analysis is different. Intermarket analysis says what you're looking at matters uh, so that you can hopefully, through that uh, interaction of various asset classes, identify the whites of the eyes of regime change to come, looking across asset classes looking across sectors to see if there's some underlying message permeating throughout the marketplace. The most classic intermarket relationship is that of oil to bonds. Traditionally, when oil prices rise, that means bond yields are likely to rise as well. Why? Because oil is a source of cost push inflationary pressure. As oil prices rise, inflation expectations typically rise. As inflation expectations rise, so to do yields to reflect that higher inflation premium. So that's a very kind of classic intermarket relationship between uh, oil and bonds. But there are a lot of other ways to look at intermarket analysis. Now, I've got a, a uh, picture here of my father's book. So for those who have been in the business for a while, you may recognize the name Bob Farrell of Merrill Lynch from the late 1980s. Uh, my father worked on Bob Farrell's team at Merrill uh, in the late 80s, alongside a gentleman named Steve Chauvin, who was relatively well known in the 90s. Uh, my father had wrote, written uh, two books on markets, one titled, uh, and a great title, Challenge of a Generation, Beyond the Crash of 87. Uh, it's probably more the challenge of the Fed with hindsight. Uh, and then this book, Intermarket Analysis and Investing, in 1990. Now, he passed away in 08. I republished this book in 2013, despite it being 30 years old or so. Uh, the book is still highly relevant. Uh, it outlines a lot of these concepts that I'm going to be bringing uh, to the forefront here in this presentation. Um, I really republished this in his honor. Now, if you are curious to read the book, I encourage you to take a look at Amazon, download the Kindle version, buy it. The only thing I'm going to ask of you is that if you're going to read it, please give an honest review, which means give it five stars. Okay. Now, what are some ways of using intermarket analysis? Well, in this presentation on lumber and gold, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, how intermarket analysis applies to the relationship of those two commodities to stocks and bonds. And I've broken this up into uh, three main parts. The first one is around asset class diffusion, uh, this idea that there's information in the behavior of lumber, in the behavior of gold that gradually diffuses to the broader stock market. 
talk about lumber, why it's such a critical commodity. I know it's been in the headlines quite a bit. I've been uh, pounding the table on Market Watch and on various other uh, media outlets that it's been a, been a big warning sign. We'll talk about that. Talk about gold. Uh, again, not as an investment, but as a signal for stocks and bonds. And then I'm going to go through various different back tests to show you that no matter how you execute, the end result is the same in terms of using lumber and gold to anticipate uh, stock market crashes, corrections, bear markets before it's too late, identifying conditions that favor the accident. And then, of course, with some examples, wrap it up and do some Q&A. Okay, so let's get started on the first part here, asset class diffusion, okay? Now, taking a, a 30,000 foot view for a moment on traditional studies on markets, most uh, academic studies, most research papers, when they look at stock markets, they look at anomalies from within an asset class. So think things like value, like growth, uh, like some of these smart beta uh, factors. Uh, most studies look within an asset class. Another way to look at that to identify ways of outperforming a passive buy and hold is to look across asset classes, which goes back to intermarket analysis. What you're looking at matters. Uh, and the idea there is that the relative movement of one part of the marketplace may at some point uh, gradually diffuse to the attentions of other investors in other parts of the marketplace, other asset classes. And that if you are able to identify that before they do, uh, that that gives you a leg up that allows you to manage risk and manage return in a much more proactive tactical type of way to again outperform over a buy and hold type of traditional investment and it turns out that lumber relative to gold has a lot of that information uh, that does gradually diffuse in terms of identifying when to play risk on risk off when to play offense defense when to know when it's sunny to speed up or raining to slow down all right, let's first talk about lumber real quick here. Um, lumber is, has been getting a lot more attention as of late because it went absolutely vertical following the low uh, back in March. But lumber, you know, oftentimes the media focuses on copper and oil. You always hear about Dr. Copper because copper is used in industrial uh, uh, production and oil because of the link, obviously, to the rest of the economy. Not much attention is really put on lumber, at least historically. And yet lumber may be one of, if not the most important commodity of all. Uh, and it should be clear as to why. It's because of housing, okay? The average home has about 14,000 board feet of lumber. Lumber prices react instantaneously to housing starts data and is the clearest real-time way of identifying what is likely gonna be happening to uh, consumer wealth, because most consumer wealth doesn't come from the stock market, it, it comes from their homes. And we know economically that housing tends to move ahead of expansions and recessions that was shown by Lemur uh, in studies there. And again, bit back on the housing starts data shown in studies by Rocker Thurman and Yoder. So that makes lumber one of the, if not the most cyclical commodity of all, because as lumber goes, so too does housing. As housing goes, so too does the U.S. consumer and obviously liquidity, reflation, and everything else in terms of what you would traditionally see in risk-on periods. You can see uh, you know, a little evidence of that from an economic standpoint when you look at U.S. building permits. Uh, going back to 1960, traditionally building permits will uh, rise coming out of a recession, which would mean lumber out, uh, doing well, uh, and fall in advance of one. Right, so if, if housing and, and building and construction is a leading indicator, then it stands to reason that so too is lumber. Now, interestingly enough, when it comes to lumber, lumber is actually, surprise, surprise, uh, a regulated commodity, just not in the way you might think. In response to concerns about deforestation and what that would mean for various species going extinct, Congress enacted the Endangered Species Act of 1973 that basically took out of the marketplace the available supply of trees okay, with which uh, you could basically use for housing through, through wood, through lumber. Uh, and what that did is it resulted in a shrinking of the available supply that could be used for construction. Now, it's not like with lumber, you can just suddenly put a seed in the ground and it grows and you can just use it a month later. It takes a lot of time. So the fact that the available supply shrank, that it takes time for a lumber to grow, means that the price of lumber then is much more determined by the demand for housing than by the supply of lumber itself, because that supply is relatively stable for the earlier mentioned reasons. So lumber, highly important from that perspective. 
Now let's talk about gold. Um, I am not interested in getting into a debate about gold. That was for the prior panel. Uh, I'm more interested in terms of what gold signifies. I think a lot of people get gold wrong. I have, I hear a lot of people talk about how gold is an inflation hedge. I hear a lot of people saying that gold's a deflation hedge. The harsh reality is that gold doesn't really correlate to a damn thing. When you look at gold against most macroeconomic variables, the correlation is effectively zero. This was shown by Lawrence in one of his papers. And when you, here's a chart of the uh, rolling correlation of the S&P to gold. Uh, you can see that the correlation is basically zero. Okay. Gold really doesn't do anything except its own thing and march it to its own beat, which is arguably why it, you, know, you can make a case it, holds a, it should hold a portion of your portfolio because it's an uncorrelated alternative asset. It is a diversifier from that perspective. The one thing that gold does correlate to historically is stock market fear and volatility. While not anywhere near as consistent as the risk-off behavior that you typically see in treasuries during these high volatility junctures, Gold for a moment in time does act like a risk off safe, safe haven play when uh, things get crazy in markets. Okay, so that makes gold perhaps one of the most non cyclical commodities you could imagine. So you've got lumber highly cyclical, and then gold non cyclical with that sort of fear component to that performance. So the question then becomes well, if you compare the two to each other, is there some interesting information that again gradually diffuses to the broader stock market? that we as asset allocators, as traders, can use to better manage risk. Okay? So in this paper titled Lumber Worth Its Weight in Gold that won the 2015 Name Founders Award, the trading rule is outlined and is very simple. Uh, first of all, it looks at rolling three months, okay, whereby you're looking at the, uh, uh, rather the, the studies show that rolling three months tend to be where most commodity momentum is strongest. Commodity momentum tends to live in that one month to 10, 12 month time frame that was shown by Mifray and Rallis. What the paper shows is using uh, the three month time frame, converting that into a rolling 13 weeks and basically making a very simple trading rule around lumber to gold. You go back to 1986, the rule is very simple and the back test uh, signal is, is uh, what we're gonna be exploring here. If lumber over the last rolling 13 weeks is outperforming gold, Let's go offense. Let's call that risk on. Let's take on more, uh, more beta, more risk in a portfolio. If gold's outperforming lumber over the last rolling 13 weeks, and this is purely up more or down less, let's go all in or, and play defense. Okay, let's try to take the pedal off the, 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 the metal and get you know, a little bit slower as we're driving. And let's obviously reevaluate that on a rolling week by week basis based on the last prior 13 weeks. And as much as I'm going to be focusing on the rolling 13 weeks, uh, the reality is this works across multiple different look back periods, which I'll also get into. Now, before I show you the, the proof that this is a valid way of looking at markets, that this is a trading signal you should consider and, and, and you know, pay attention to, it's important to identify what that signal really tells you about, that relative movement of lumber to gold as it relates to stocks and bonds. This is a look at the S&P 500's average annualized volatility. When lumber outperforms gold, okay, this kind of blue purple color, and then when gold outperforms lumber in the red. You can see that when lumber outperforms gold, the going forward volatility for the stock market is about 13.5%. When gold outperforms lumber, the opposite, risk off, defense, stock market volatility rises on average to 19.4%. And again, it should make sense. Lumber is a tell on housing. If lumber is doing, doing poorly, that would suggest that there's some disinflationary pressure. There's a slowdown in construction and as such, probably a breakdown in housing prices, which has other more serious knock-on effects to the broader economy and to risk sentiment uh, in general. Uh, this is another way to look at it. This is looking at the VXO, VIX-like index, just has a little bit of longer history. Same idea though, looking at some kind of level to identify VIX uh, and volatility uh, metrics. When lumber is outperforming gold, that average VXO level is about 19. When gold is outperforming lumber, it's about 22. Okay. So again, lumber and gold, the power of this, of looking at these commodities is not about investing in them. It's about what that relative relationship tells you about conditions that favor an accident, risk 
Okay, the tail wagging. Okay, I'm a, a big fan of Nassim Taleb, the Black Swan, anti fragility, all this. You know, I always tell people I don't know what mile marker I might crash my car, which is the Black Swan, but I know the conditions that favor the accident. I know when to slow down. Lumber and Gold can tell you a little bit about when to slow down and when to speed up. So let me prove to you that this works, that this is not just uh, something sort of haphazard here. Um, because again, there is a causation, not just a correlation to volatility in the stock market. And take you through various different back tests to kind of prove this out. Now, the way this was structured in uh, the white paper, uh, Lumber Worth Its Weight in Gold, is doing a spectrum of risk, going from most defense to most offense. Because an important part of any strategy is not just the signal, it's the opportunity set. And I think, by the way, on a side note, that's a wildly underappreciated fact. So many people focus on signals and not the way you execute on the signals, right? So this is a look at, you know, the various ways of executing risk off, risk on, defense to offense, going from most defensive on the five to seven year treasury index. Uh, you can see that that's got the lowest vol to uh, buy right index, defensive, low volatility defensive, the SP 500 being the baseline of offense defense. And then the more offense uh, opportunity plays, which are the Russell 2000 small caps, Morgan Stanley cyclical index and high beta. And again, you can see the average vol is higher for each of these on average, obviously, and the beta is also increasing, all right? So you go from least risk to most risk. So let's use, now I'm going to show you, you know, let's use these opportunity sets. I'm going to show you various back tests. Focus less on the numbers. I want you to focus more on the why, okay, of the reasoning. Now, so lumber outperforming gold, risk on. Gold outperforming lumber, risk off, right? Very kind of straightforward. Risk on will be defined in each of these back tests and risk off will be defined in each of these back tests. Okay. Now, first way of uh, doing this kind of risk on risk off dynamic when it comes to using lumber gold to manage stocks and bonds is to use stocks and bonds. Meaning that when lumber is outperforming gold, let's go into the S&P 500 risk on. When gold is outperforming lumber, let's use that five to seven year treasury index. Let's go into treasuries as the risk off play, okay? So risk on equities, risk off treasuries. Using lumber outperforming gold, risk on, gold outperforming lumber, risk off, okay? So you call this the lumber gold bond strategy. You see here the back test, cumulative returns about almost 2,000%. All on S&P, all on bonds, all on treasuries, versus a buy and hold of the S&P. This outperforms the S&P strongly. Remember, though, it's not just about return. It's also about risk. You know, your average return is 11.2 versus 10.1 annualized. Your vol, though, is quite a bit less. Your annualized volatility going all in S&P, all in treasuries, using purely lumber and gold as your signal for the timing uh, goes is 10.2% versus 16.7. It's actually a pretty dramatic decline. Your sharp ratio, your Sertino ratio, your risk-adjusted measures are a lot higher than just a buy and hold. This is a big one, and I'm going to focus on this in the next slide. Your max drawdown is about 14.5% peak to trough versus buy and hold of the S&P, max drawdown of about 54%, okay, historically. Average alpha about 4.4% and rotations per year about 6.8 on average. Now, something interesting here, right? I'm showing you back test statistics of a strategy that rotates fully into the S&P or fully into bonds based on the behavior of lumber and gold. Traditional and, and it far outperforms, right? Traditional finance says what? The only way to get more return is what? Take more risk. Yet what's the riskiest thing this strategy is doing? The beta of one, the S&P, which is the risk on side. So maybe it's not about taking on more risk. Maybe it's about taking on the right risk at the right time. And that is a very different mindset, I think, than what I would argue are nouveau bulls who enter the stock market simply trying to go aggressive playing long and playing beta. Risk off actually matters quite a bit. Let's kind of explore that a little bit more. This is a look at the historical drawdowns of the S&P 500 and of that strategy okay, of rotating around stocks, the S&P 500 and treasuries using the lumber and gold signal. 
see red is the S&P 500, those drawdowns, and uh, blue is that rotation of uh, the S&P and treasuries using lumber and gold. What do you notice? The drawdown is significantly less when you're rotating and using that signal. Now, this is really, really, really important, okay? Because as much as we live in the small sample, the reality is that markets live in a world of long cycles. And the reality is that volatility matters because most people get out of the markets because of fear at the exact wrong time. Here comes the S&P going down. Ah, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Ah, oh, this is terrible. Oh, oh my God, I'm going to sue down here, 2000, 2002. What the hell is going on? You know, that's the joke about buy and hold is that pretty much nobody holds. And they don't hold for this very reason. I always say to people that your ability to stick to a strategy matters more than the strategy itself. I don't care what diet you follow, you're going to lose weight. You got to stick to it. That's not to say the strategy doesn't matter, but you have to know thyself, right? Know yourself, okay? And, and, and stick to a strategy that helps you, uh, identify a strategy that helps you stick to it. And to the extent that you can minimize drawdowns, this matters in terms of your ability to have a longer term approach, okay? And again, you can tell that something about that lumber and gold signal tells you the conditions that favor the accident, favor that volatility spike, that drawdown. You notice that this is updated to 2015 or so, which is when the paper uh, won the Founders Award. I'll talk about the most recent period, but uh, spoiler alert, lumber relative to gold went risk off February 23rd, okay? So, and we'll get into that. All right, let's move up the uh, strategy risk spectrum here, okay? Again, lumber outperforming gold, go into the S&P as your risk on play. Now, instead of treasuries, let's go into the buy right index, okay? So let's use an options overlay. So either S&P risk on or S&P with a, with a hedging component, okay? And the idea is to mitigate downside risk. So again, we're just switching up the opportunity set to validate the signal. You can see the cumulative return is roughly in line with that of the S&P. But importantly, again, your volatility is lower. Your sharp ratio is higher. Your drawdown is lower. So similar kind of findings, just the opportunity set obviously results in different overall metrics because it's still equities. But again, lumber to gold does tell you something about risk, okay, before it's too late. This is a look at uh, same deal, risk on, risk off, looking at the S&P 500 as risk on. But instead of an options overlay, let's go into something that's just lower volatility, an S&P 500 low vol, lower beta constructed index. So the idea is a beta of one or beta of less than one. Rotate around that, lumber outperforming gold, beta of one, gold outperforming lumber, okay, beta less than one. Now this has different start dates, which is why the numbers look a, bit, a little bit different on the S&P 500 itself here, but you can see the cumulative return again is higher, rotating around S&P, S&P uh, low vol, Risk on, risk off, respectively. You see the volatility is lower, sharp ratio higher. Again, same kind of deal across the board. This does fairly well. Not as well as treasuries, but fairly well. Okay. Now, let's face it. In a bull market, everyone's a junkie. Everybody wants to take more risk. Everybody wants to uh, participate in that which is just rocketing. FOMO is real, right? So let's now switch it up. Instead of risk on being the S&P, let's make risk on something with more risk. Okay, again, moving up that risk spectrum I showed you earlier. So lumber outperforming gold, let's take more risk. Gold outperforming lumber risk off defense. Let's make that the S&P. So now we're just flipping the role of the S&P as the offense or defense in the opportunity set. Okay. So lumber outperforming gold, in this case, let's go into all in small caps, Russell 2000. Gold outperforming lumber, let's go all in large caps. So think of this as a market cap rotation strategy. All you're doing is going into very simplistically the S&P 500 or Russell 2000 based purely on the behavior of lumber to gold, okay? This to me was always the most fascinating back test uh, of all of those that are in the paper. This is a look at the, uh, so, so lumber outperforming gold going to small caps, gold outperforming lumber going to large caps. You can see the, Buy and hold performance of the Russell 2000 here. Buy and hold performance of the S&P 500 here. And then the rotation of the two using lumber and gold. What do you notice? The cumulative return is pretty much double that of the S&P, almost three times, or more than three times roughly that of the Russell 2000, around three times. Um, 
annualized uh, return is a lot higher, okay, than the two, although you're just rotating around the two. Your volatility is slightly higher than the S&P, but still pretty good. Your risk adjusted metrics are great. And interestingly enough, your drawdown's less. And your average annualized alpha just doing straight up cap rotations about 280 basis points. By the way, all of these back tests show alpha, which is phenomenal. Alpha that's not supposed to exist, okay, is phenomenal just rotating around this very simplistic indicator. Um, now, when you take a step back, I want to just kind of focus on this for a bit. Why is it that, that Lumber and Gold tells you something about taking more risk going to smaller cap as opposed to larger cap? Well, there's a, there's a causation there. When Lumber outperforms gold, that would suggest that housing is about to pick up. Housing is a tell on the U.S. consumer. Small caps are more sensitive to the domestic U.S. side than multinational large caps. So it stands to reason that if lumber is the most cyclical commodity, is the biggest tell on the U.S. consumer, that that which is most sensitive to the U.S. consumer, small caps, should benefit the most. So there is a reasoning there as to why you'd want to tilt more towards smaller cap names as opposed to larger cap. But this to me is a fascinating kind of backtest within that construct. All right, let's take on more risk for risk on. Lumber outperforming gold, let's now do the S&P 500 high beta index to just ramp up the beta, still being large caps. Risk off, let's make the S&P when gold outperforms lumber. You see that strategy really does substantially also outperform the S&P 500, but there is a cost. The cost being much higher volatility, which makes sense because you're playing with high, higher beta vol and S&P beta one. All right, so on average, yes, it should be higher volatility. Your risk adjusted metrics are kind of the same. Your drawdown's kind of ugly. So this is kind of an interesting finding as well. It does work, but in reality, it's more just sort of scaling up risk and return in the traditional finance uh, sense. Uh, and I think as a side note, this kind of dovetails into the argument that high beta is overpriced. It may be why the low volatility anomaly uh, exists to begin with, that low vol stocks tend to have better risk adjusted returns than high uh, vol stocks. Right? But broader point here is that if you're going to try and pl take more risk, you're actually probably better off using small caps as opposed to ramping up your, high, your, your actual beta uh, in the same cap range. Okay. And uh, finally here on the offense side, okay, lumber outperforming gold risk on again, gold outperforming lumber risk off. Let's make the risk on the cyclical index. Might as well go for the jugular, right? Because lumber is the most cyclical commodity of all. Might as well make it cyclicals as your way of playing offense. Okay. And gold outperforming lumber. Let's go into the S&P again. So again, still equity rotation, just cyclicals or S&P. Okay, similar to the Russell 2000 study. Here's the cyclical index. Here's the S&P. And you can see the rotation of the two results in substantially higher numbers, better risk adjusted metrics. By the way, I didn't mention this early, but I want to just kind of poke a hole at something. These are all back tests I'm showing. Right? All these papers, everything I do is around back tests. And I got to tell you, as somebody that used to do the, the media punditry route, uh, I'm going to outright say it. Most of the stuff that you hear about on TV is complete bullshit because it's not actually tested. Okay. You've got to really test what you're saying. Now, some people don't like back tests. When I was on the road doing presentations at CFA chapters, I'd always ask the audience, how many of you don't like back tests? Some people would raise their hand. I would then ask, well, how many of you believe in buy and hold? Those same people would raise their hand. And I would then smile and say, well, I guess that means everybody believes in back testing. Because buy and hold is a back test with one trade. Nobody ever thinks of it like that. But it's factually true. And sometimes back tests fail, like that buy and hold back test of Japan, going back to 1989. Okay? Now, let me kind of you know, combine the two. Where do you have the best ultimate sort of combination of, uh, of risk on and risk off? What's the ideal opportunity set? Lumber outperforming gold, I showed you it's Russell 2000 and or cyclicals. Risk off is treasuries. Okay, so this is that back test, the blue and the green using just small caps or, um, or cyclicals, okay? And you can see that against the S&P, the red line versus Russell 2000 versus treasuries. So the rotation of the two results in phenomenal uh, returns from a back tested perspective. Now, I wanna pause here. This looks like a great strategy, right? Phenomenal. Who, who wouldn't want to bite that chart? What do you notice happens in the mid-90s? 
All right, here's the S&P, the red line, and here's that rotation. What happens in the mid-90s? The S&P 500 is catching up to the strategy. It actually overtakes it into the end of 1999. If you happen to launch this strategy, if you're running this approach starting 1995 and the market's running away from you, are you going to stick to that strategy? Are you going to say that strategy sucks? Your ability to stick to a strategy matters more than the strategy itself. Guess what? Not every juncture results in strategy doing well. By the way, let's talk about why it does well. It's not about the upside. The reason lumber gold signal is powerful is actually not as much because of lumber. It's more because of gold, meaning it's more about the relative weakness of lumber. Okay. In that back test I just showed you, which is phenomenal, the up capture against the stock market, how much it captures of the upside is about 66%. And yet I'm showing you something that substantially outperforms. But how can I outperform? It's only capturing two thirds of the market's upside. It's because when it's doing its rotations, most of the outperformance isn't from the upside. It's from the downside. The down capture is one third. Your up to down ratio is, is double, which tells you that if you really want to make, get returns longer term, it's not about taking more risk. It's about the right risk at the right time. And Lumber and Gold can help you with that, uh, identifying conditions that favor the accident. Now, by the way, going back to the mid-90s example, the reason that it, that was a difficult juncture is that if you have a strategy like this, which thrives on down capture, you have to be in a cycle where there's downside to capture. That means that if you're in an environment like the mid 90s or like the post QE3 period where it's very smooth up into the right, those environments suck. Why? Because you are stuck in a purgatory of death by a thousand cuts of false positives, meaning you play defense and the market says, screw you, I'm going to keep going higher. So the cycle very much determines your likelihood of that strategy doing quote unquote well. Now, importantly, that's why the best risk off is treasuries because treasuries allow you the the ability to be wrong in your signal, meaning higher risk based on lumber to gold, playing risk off, but still make money in the false positive. This is why you cannot look at this signal from the standpoint of going to cash, which has no momentum, no compounding potential. And you can't look at the signal from the standpoint of going short, because if you're short and you're wrong, you lose money one for one. At least if you're in treasuries, if you're low volatility, if you're using an options overlay to hedge a little bit, that at least allows you the ability to be wrong in your signal, but still make money until the accident inevitably comes. Okay. Now, let's talk about some history here. So let me prove to you that this is not some form of luck. Because I always have people that say, looking at uh, some, some indicators, oh, that was just lucky. Oh, you got lucky in, in your indicators and your writing saying risk on, risk off in the lead lag report. Uh, when I was saying it March, uh, uh, January 27 to go risk off, and I was saying risk on March 31st, okay? Let me prove to you that that's not the case when you're using quantitative indicators. Anybody here remember 1987? No one could have seen that coming, right? Okay, this is a look at the ratio of lumber to gold. Top pane, rolling 13-week rate of change. When that rate of change is positive above the zero line, okay? That means risk on, otherwise risk off. Here's the S&P in 1987. Here's the VXO VIX index. Guess what? Before it was too late, lumber relative to gold turned lower and the 87 crash happened afterwards. Okay, let's keep playing with that. That's just luck. Here comes 1990. Same kind of idea. Ratio of lumber to gold, rolling 13 weeks, S&P 500, 1990. Here's the VIX. Guess what? Same deal. Signal came in before that bear market happened, which by the way, was a housing driven one uh, in 1990. Maybe not so lucky anymore. Okay. Here's 2000, 2002. You have several junctures here where the lumber and gold signal warned you. Okay. Tech wreck. Well, guess what? It turns out lumber and gold warned you also about that. Okay. Two junctures here where you can see, obviously, immediately afterwards, the VIX. We're not depending on your definition of immediate, right? It was a warning sign that before it was too late, conditions favored an accident. The accident occurred. The VIX spiked. I'm trying to run through this just in the interest of time here. 2007, 2009, um, seems like a lifetime ago, but you know how a lot of people said that Lehman was unpredictable? You sure about that? Lumber to gold gave you the signal to go risk off about two weeks before Lehman happened. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. 
This stuff is powerful. Now, note, it's not that every time lumber is weak relative to gold, you're going to have an event. It means the conditions are there for the event. That's why you have to keep on sticking to these signals, even when they are wrong. Because just because it's raining doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have an accident. Just like just because it's sunny doesn't mean you're guaranteed uh, to, to not have one. Right? You have to stick to a strategy, stick to the signals. And more often than not, when it comes to longer term wealth generation, it's not about being up more. It's about identifying the conditions under which tails can happen. Because as we've seen this year, all you need is one of those events. And that juncture can define a generation of wealth. Okay. And I'll give you one more on 2011, the summer crash of 2011, largely what I kind of, when I started getting into the meeting, got getting known. Okay. Same deal, went risk off before the debt downgrade. And just as uh, the euro was starting to go crazy, as people started debating whether the currency would exist. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that the, the, uh, the signal came in uh, February 23rd, prior to COVID crash really starting, and then went risk on uh, June 14th. I mentioned that in the Lee Lag report. Um, that just means it avoided the entire craziness. It worked even this year, folks. So this is powerful stuff. Now, some people have asked me, well, why don't you create some kind of a strategy around this that people can invest in? Uh, stay tuned. This is a hypothetical back test of uh, a risk on risk off index. Okay, using a different look back period, but same idea, lumber to gold, risk on, gold to lumber risk off. This is calculated by an independent third party index provider. Uh, you can see that index, which is gonna be called the ATAC risk on risk off index, substantially outperforms the S&P. And again, it's really because of that downside. You have to manage risk before it's too late. So with that question, I think we have maybe a minute or two. I'll just kind of look at the uh, chat, unless Blake, you have anything you wanna kind of ask uh, yourself. But uh, happy to answer questions. Again, feel free to reach out to me, Michael Guy at Lead Lagapur. I'm going to actually be back on in, at 12:30 Eastern here, uh, talk about some other things, which you know hopefully should be interesting. But um, I'm gonna have to kind of answer some quick questions here. You, you know, I've, I've actually I've, 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 I'm, I can field a few, Michael, because there's uh, there's a couple really good ones in there that yeah, I sure. think you might want to address. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, Michael's going to be back here in. Uh, it's a, about 45 minutes. So if, if you guys, uh, I've got a lot of comments about how great your presentation was. And I think it's fascinating, actually, the the way that gold versus lumber. And I'm, I'm thinking like near term as a trader and think about the price action that we saw in lumber just over the last couple of weeks and how that's probably really flipped your indicators um, uh, over the last couple of weeks, hasn't it? Yeah, so look, the, the, you've had a complete, effectively a crash in lumber price. So then again, they also went vertical in a way that was they did. arguably yeah. too manic and unjustified, right? right. Look, they, they're, they're, now some people say that's, you know, it went vertical to begin with because of supply disruptions. I think that's valid. Um, but there was clearly demand because you could see that in housing construction and housing data and housing home builder stocks, right? There was a confirming aspect to it. Now, uh, let's go back to that back test on small caps, right? Typically when lumber does well, small caps do well. Lumber, uh, small caps stopped doing well about four or five weeks into the advance in, in the tail end of that lumber blow off that now we're seeing the end of and the reversal of, sure. um, which is a little bit odd, right? When I look at lumber to relative to gold here, it's signaling, be careful. It's, we're, we're pretty much in that juncture. When I look at utilities to, tr to, uh, to the S&P, another risk off indicator, same deal, risk, you know, suggest conditions favor an accident, treasuries, conditions favor an accident. I know everyone's focused on the election, focused on COVID, I put a tweet out on at lead lag report where I said, I think actually the bigger risk may be what's happening in European financials very short term. Um, the, everything around me suggests that the weather that we're, we're, the, we may have been in the eye of the storm, that maybe the, the storm is actually here. Again, that doesn't mean we're going to have a crash. It means you got to slow down and that you got, we could be entering a high risk juncture. And I don't give a damn what people say about fighting. Uh, don't fight the fed. There is always a time to fight the fed. That's right. And definitely a time to be careful and slow down to use your, use your analogy. I, I like to use the, um, I like to use the analogy of driving, uh, uh, you know, that you, ha you, you, you have a, a fork in the road. Um, you're not going to speed up into the fork. You're going to slow down into it. And that's exactly what the lead lag report seems like it's telling us right now. Um, Kirk Spano, he says, uh, hey, hey, Michael, uh, Kirk Spano from Market Watch, And Kirk has been an, he, we've interviewed him on the uh, face webinars. Uh, here on our on a daily basis, 
Uh, he says, how are you doing? Love the book, by the way. Question, given the massive changing demand characteristics of the oil market, both short-term and long-term, do you see the relationship of oil to interest rates in the economy in general changing? And if so, how so? Yeah, interesting question, Kirk. It's been a while, man. I'm glad, I'm glad to, to see you here. Um, so I think yes, but I also think that um, it, it's tricky in the sense that this is the thing with any kind of indicator, right? A lot of people that may have been relying on oil as an indicator for reflation, um, I would argue it kind of worked here from a contrarian standpoint because when oil was whatever, negative 47, you were pretty much close to the low in all risk assets, right? And this kind of deflation narrative, at least in that moment in time. But it's always tricky whenever you're trying to identify the relationship of, of something to something else, if it's not quote unquote working in the here and now, because if you're going to try and editorialize and put a narrative as to saying, uh, you know, uh, oil is no longer as important as it used to be for the economy, and that's why it's not as effective as they tell. The problem is there are plenty of other junctures where you have plenty of false positives tracking oil and you didn't have the same reasoning, right? So in other words, because the mind loves a narrative, yes, maybe it's true that the economy is less dependent upon oil and that makes oil as, an, as a thing to watch less important, or it may not, right? I mean, I, I, I kind of go back to, I don't know what the longer term holds and maybe that causation comes back in. You know, so if you suddenly have an oil shock again, which you know, is not outside the realm of possibility, suddenly... Sure. Um, the oil is more dependent on uh, the, the economy, even though the U.S. is, you know, uh, much less dependent on foreign oil, uh, we'll feel that. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's so many questions, Michael. So I'm sure, I'm sure these people are going to be coming back probably in the next 45 minutes after Lynn Alden, and they're, they're probably going to ask some more questions. But um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to ask the very first question that came in. This came in from Randall and he says, how does gold fluctuate? when panic or black swan events appear in the market and why gold and, and not something else? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I think the not something else, I'll address that one first, um, is because there aren't that many places to go, right? Listen, the reality is this industry makes money on fees. Fees are made money on more uh, sort of consecutive ups than downs, right? Because people love things going up. So the vast majority of available products that are out there are risk on. They're all forms of beta. They're all forms of taking on more risk, right? So there are very few real risk-off trades. Treasuries are one of them. Uh, the yen was one of them, at least prior to, you know, abenomics. Uh, right. And gold historically still has a sort of short-term behavior. And I think to some extent, there's, a, there's sort of a flight to safety in gold when that happens, because it's not just of historical uh, reasons viewing gold as money and as a store of, of wealth, but just because it's one of those things where if those if a lot of people are trying to take haven, take safe haven, and they don't like treasuries, well, you might as well go into the thing that you can bet on will probably be money in the absence of fiat. Very good. That's a great answer. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap us up here, but I want to say that uh, for the lead lag report, you're running a special uh, for the Traders Summit attendees. Is that correct? Yeah. So not to be, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? ABC always be cl closing. It's also always be promoting. Uh, if you go to leelagreport.com, two weeks free, you put promo code Trader Summit, a capital T, capital S, one word. It is a case sensitive. If you have issues, you can contact me through the site. You get 30% off. Uh, you know, there's content put out, out there every single day. Um, and you'll see the actual risk on risk off signals, including the lumber to gold one. You know, I, I purposely use the tagline that this, it's designed to anticipate corrections and volatility because those are the only things that matter. And importantly, it's not like the old line of more money has been lost waiting for a correction than not. It's about trying to find the right opportunity set during those high risk periods, rather than trying to bet, make a directional bet, which is where you really do lose money. Well, that makes, that's awesome. And that was actually a great way to end. But I do want to mention that you did say something about your promo code. It was uh, capital T, capital S, one S, Traders Summit. We had somebody that that tried to tried to use the promo code and probably didn't put capital T and capital S. So, uh, Michael, your presentation was absolutely phenomenal. I'm excited to learn more about you and about what your your lead lag report is. Thank you so much for your time today, and thank you so much for being a sponsor of the Trader Summit. No, oh, my pleasure, guys. I appreciate the invite. See you at uh, well, twelve. Great to hear you again, Michael. Yeah, Doug. It's been a while, man. Yeah, you, Michael. Great to hear you. Yeah. Thank you. You Thank still you got it, man. Still got it. <laughs>